This is the story of an England that never was, radical, militarized, and truly Protestant, and of the king who tried to take us there. His quest to change England was to tear apart his family and his country, to set brother against sister and church against people. His name was Edward, and he inherited the throne when he was only nine. For 25 years, King Henry VIII had been trying to father a male heir. Finally, after three wives and two daughters, he had succeeded. When Queen Jane Seymour gave birth to a son, the country rejoiced. On the 12th of October, 1537, Edward was born here at Hampton Court. Three days later, the baby was christened. The galleries, chambers and halls of the palace were hung with tapestry. The baby was carried in procession through them. All the splendor and magnificence of the Tudor court was there. There were drums and trumpets, heralds and lords and ladies. And walking after the baby, sharing in the triumph, was the midwife who had delivered him and the wet nurse who was suckling him. The christening itself took place on a high platform in the centre of the chapel. The font was of silver, lined with soft linen and filled with warmed water. And there, under a canopy of cloth of gold, the baby was christened Edward and the heralds proclaimed his titles, Duke of Cornwall, Earl of Chester, son and heir of the right high, mighty and victorious prince, King Henry VIII. Then, tragedy struck. The birth had been a long and difficult one. At first, Queen Jane seemed to recover. Then, she caught purple fever, and within a week of the christening, she was dead. It would be easy to exaggerate the emotional impact on Edward of his mother's death at such an early age. Even when their mothers were alive, royal babies, especially boys, wouldn't normally spend much time with them. Moreover, there were many substitutes on which Edward's affections could fix. Edward's infant years were spent amongst the women, like any other Tudor boy. Accounts of the time describe Edward as both merry and pretty, a promising future king, loved and spoiled by his father on his infrequent visits, but looked after by his devoted nurses. He was moved between the various royal residences, but spent much time in a house in Hertfordshire, where for a while, both his half-sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, lived with him in a strange game of happy families. This picture was painted in 1544, when Edward was six years old. It's normally called the family of Henry VIII, but it's not about family in the modern sense in which relationships are about love and affection. Instead, it's dynasty in which relationships are about power. That's why in the middle, so much bigger than everybody else, is there the king, Henry VIII. Next to him is the queen, but it's not the actual queen of 1544. Instead, it's Jane Seymour. She's long dead, but she's shown next to Henry because she's the mother of Edward, the heir. And he is on his father's right hand, snuggling up to him, not out of affection, but to symbolize that he's the successor. 
On either side are Edward's two half-sisters. Mary is the daughter of Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Elizabeth is the daughter of Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn. Mary and Elizabeth were declared bastards when their mothers were divorced, but they appear in this picture because Henry had decided once more to include them in the succession and to do it moreover by act of parliament. This laid down that the heir was first Edward. If he died without heirs, second Mary, and if she died without heirs, third Elizabeth. The seeds of more than a decade of trouble was so. Remarkably, Edward has left us his own account of the turbulent years of his childhood, written as if he were a character in his own drama. The year of our Lord, 1537, was a prince born to King Harry VIII by Jane Seymour, then Queen. When he was six, Edward was brought back here to Hampton Court to begin his education, the ambition and scope of which he faithfully recorded. The learning of tongues, of the scripture, of philosophy and all liberal sciences. He'd already learned, of course, to read and write in English, but now the serious business of teaching him Latin got underway. His tutor was Dr Richard Cox. Cox was an able man, but he was also arrogant and dogmatic. And it's clear that the early encounters between Cox and Edward were bruising affairs. Literally so, because Cox did not spare the birch on his princely pupil, thus overcoming his captain will, as he described it. But perhaps most importantly, Richard Cox was a Protestant, as were all of Edward's later tutors, and this was the faith which Edward himself was passionately to adopt. All across Europe, Protestantism was spreading from its original heartland in Germany. It was more than just a different form of church service. It represented a different way of seeing and experiencing the world. We still have many of Edward's schoolroom essays, which show us just how much influence his tutor's Protestantism and their hatred of the Pope had on the young prince. This, for instance, is the draft of Edward's French treatise against the papal supremacy, a subject on which Edward felt and expressed himself very strongly. So much so indeed that at times his tutor, Jean Belmain, feels obliged to tone his language down. As for example, in this passage here, in which Edward describes the torments inflicted by the Pope on the faithful. To show his identification with the faithful, throughout Edward refers to them as nous, we. This is too much for Belmain. He crosses out the we and replaces it with they. It's more impersonal, more royal. Edward dutifully incorporates the changes into the next draft of the treatise, but I think it rather went against the grain, because in the fullness of time, Edward was to show that he was prepared to be just as radical in practice as he'd been here at first on paper. On January the 28th, 1547, King Henry VIII died. When Edward and his sister Elizabeth were told, they both wept. England had lost a king, and Edward had lost a father. For the small boy, Henry must have seemed a lot to live up to. From the earliest moments of his consciousness, Edward would have known that he was the son of a great man. Nowadays, we don't think of Henry as Henry the Great. 
but that is how he was presented at the time, and certainly how he will have been presented to his son. The first portrait of Edward, painted when he was only 18 months old, has underneath it some Latin verse, the essence of which is the exhortation to Edward to try and be like your father. These words would have been dinned into him at every stage. But even as the king's goldsmith was creating a miniature crown to fit on the boy king's head, Edward's position was becoming more awkward. Henry had left explicit instructions for a council to rule collectively on his son's behalf until he was old enough to take control. But in the few days after his father's death, the arrangements unraveled as the councillors scrambled for power. One man emerged triumphant, Edward's uncle, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset. His ambition was to cast a long shadow over Edward's reign. Edward's coronation, officiated over by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, was controversial too. It heralded the start of a religious conflict that would lead to rebellion against the crown. When Edward came here to Westminster Abbey to be crowned King of England, France, and Ireland. He was only nine years old. He wasn't the youngest person to be crowned king. Nevertheless, his was the most extraordinary coronation in English history. Before the high altar here, the Archbishop of Canterbury first anointed and crowned him. Then he delivered a sermon which undercut the whole meaning of the service. It was a fitting start to what was to be a radical reign. All things being prepared for the coronation, the king came to the Palace of Westminster. Then he was crowned King of England, France and Ireland, and so was brought to the hall to dinner, where he sat with the crown on his head. Naturally, Edward neither recognised nor recorded what was really new and remarkable about his coronation service. That is, that it was a sustained attack on the Church of England as then constituted. It was Cranmer's own sermon that struck the heaviest blows. Nothing that the church could do, he told the startled congregation. Neither the anointing nor the coronation could add anything to Edward's intrinsic power. Instead, Edward's power came directly from God, and he was answerable for his exercise only to God and that power was given to him for a single purpose, to reform and to purify the Church of England. The stained glass was smashed, the candles were extinguished, and even the rood itself, the image of the suffering Christ, was torn down, burned, and replaced by Edward's royal arm. As a Protestant, Edward was in full accord with these reforms, but his own life was far removed from the realities of the world outside. He remained safe in the royal palaces, studying, riding, and playing with his best friend, Barnaby Fitzpatrick, who had been brought up with him since they were both aged six. When they were apart, Edward would write to Barnaby in the warmest of terms, urging him to write more often and assuring him that Edward was the gladder, the oftener I hear from you. It was to be the closest friendship of Edward's life. For the moment, Edward was only the figurehead at the centre of the court. The real power lay in the hands of his uncle, the Duke of Somerset the man who now ruled as his Lord Protector and who kept Edward carefully under control. 
As the problems of government washed around them, it was Somerset who made the decisions, and often in his own interests. While Edward continued to study and play, his money and his power were controlled by his uncle. Somerset did not even allow the king any pocket money. Somerset's stinginess provided an opportunity for Edward's other, younger uncle, Lord Sudley. He tried to usurp his brother's place by slipping coins to the young king. This was behaviour that Somerset could not tolerate. Sudley was condemned for treason and was beheaded at the instigation of his own brother. Edward recorded the event in typical deadpan style. There was a notable disputation of the sacrament in the Parliament House. Also, the Lord Sudley was condemned to death and died the march ensuing. Edward was becoming inured to loss. But Somerset's power was coming to an end. In 1549, the government introduced a new prayer book. While its theology was hardly radical, its language was. It was in English, not in the familiar Latin. This was enough to lead to rebellion. The uprising started in the western counties, and the rebels burned the prayer book in public. People began to rise in the where Sir William and would put them down, overrun and slay them. Then they rose in Sussex, Hampshire, Kent, Gloucestershire, Suffolk, Warwickshire, Essex, Hertfordshire. Edward followed the progress of the revolts day by day in his chronicle. There's no sign that he understood the causes which had driven his people to revolt, much less that he sympathised with them. Instead, he treated the story of the suppression of the revolts as a set of military exercises in siege warfare, in ambushes. He was particularly excited when 900 of the rebels were massacred in a single day. But at the beginning of October, there's a sudden change of tone in his chronicle. In the meantime, in England, arose great stirs, likely to increase much if it had not been well foreseen. Because the troubles had shifted, they were no longer out there in the shires of England. Instead, they'd come to the heart of the palace. They were in the council chamber. They'd even penetrated into the inner sanctum of Edward's own private apartments. And when the troubles began, the king was here at Hampton Court. Somerset had seemed hesitant, even sympathetic to the rebels, and the council turned against him. Fearing a coup, Somerset made a rash and desperate decision. On October the 6th, 1549, he dragged Edward out of bed and took the king with him to the fortified castle of Windsor. This was the night on which Edward would grow up from boy to king. brought out of the armory at Hampton Court and people to be raised. That night, with all the people, at nine or ten o'clock at night, I went to Windsor and there was watch and ward kept every night. Somerset hoped that his position would be unassailable now that he had Edward secure inside the massive walls of the keep at Windsor Castle. For centuries, Windsor had been a stronghold of the English kings, and it was still well maintained against possible attack. But Somerset had completely underestimated Edward himself. The young king was outraged by his uncle's actions. He soon made it clear that he was very unhappy. He exaggerated the symptoms of the cold that he'd caught on the night ride from Hampton Court, and he complained vociferously about the quality of his accommodation. It was damp, there were no galleries or gardens to walk in. 
with any other 12-year-old. It would have been a bad case of the sulks. With Edward, it was a signal that the royal favour on which the power of all Tudor ministers depended, even during a minority, had been withdrawn. Faced with Edward's hostility and the arm strength of the other councillors, Somerset lost his nerve and surrendered. While Edward returned to Hampton Court, Somerset was taken to the tower. There he was interrogated and confessed to 29 charges of treason. Two years later, he would be dead, a fate which Edward regarded with equanimity. Somerset had his head cut off upon Tower Hill between eight and nine o'clock in the morning. Why had Edward turned so decisively against his uncle? In his chronicle, he carefully notes down the official charges, false, ambition, vainglory, entering into rash wars, enriching himself of my treasure, following his own opinion, and doing all by his own authority. For Edward, this last was the real nub of the matter. He was already profoundly irritated with Somerset for continuing to treat him as a child, but dragging him to Windsor was the last straw. I am a prisoner, the king said. No Tudor would ever put up with that. By 1550, Edward was 13 years old and ready to begin to step into his father's shoes. Somerset had no successor as protector. Instead, a council ruled in the king's name and increasingly at his direction. For Edward was mature and driven far beyond his years. He was cold too and the coolness with which he recorded both his uncle's executions had become second nature to him. For a king he knew was not there for sentiment, but as the direct agent of God's purpose. But as Edward reached out for this God-given, God-driven kingship, the force of his convictions led him into confrontation with his elder half-sister, Mary. Since their father's death, Mary had stayed well away from court, living quietly on the estate she had been given in East Anglia. She was now in her thirties, unmarried and frequently ill, but she could not be ignored since, as heir to the throne, she was a powerful figurehead for any opposition. And what divided Edward and Mary was religion. In particular, the prayer book of 1549, which Edward had so warmly endorsed. The people of the Western counties had already risen in revolt against the religious changes imposed by the prayer book. It was Edward's own sister about to do the same. Mary was a devout Catholic who refused to give up saying her beloved Latin prayers and rituals, even though they were now illegal. Edward objected to her behaviour on religious grounds, but also for more pragmatic reasons. If Mary were allowed to continue practising her faith, she would act as a focus for further resistance and rebellion. The struggle between Edward and Mary commenced in the spring of 1550, and it was Mary's side who made the first move. Her powerful cousin, the Emperor Charles V, sent ambassadors to London to ask Edward and the Privy Council if she could be exempted from the new legislation. Ideally, she would be given permission, formally and by letters patent, to continue to hear the Mass, both for her and also for the members of her household. The council listened to the demand courteously, but Edward's own mind was closed. April 1550. The Emperor's ambassador desired leave by letters patent that my Lady Mary might have leave to say mass 
it was denied him. The Chronicle shows just how central the young king was to his own government. It's what he saw, what he heard, what he himself actually discovered. It's often the very best account of the political events of the reign. But sadly, the Chronicle is not a confidential diary, and it tells us very little of Edward's private thoughts. Instead, he's very matter-of-fact. He was writing to record what he thought was important, the political events, the battles, the details of debts and trade, not to hold up an emotional mirror to himself. What does come across very clearly, however, is the strength of Edward's feelings about his sister's persistent Catholicism and the strength of his support for a full-blooded Protestant reform of the church. The Chronicle is full of details about such reforms, the removal of altars, the abolition of saints' days, the destruction of idolatrous images. Bishop of London's injunctions touch plucking down a super altar, sent to every bishop to pluck down the altars, altars and such like ceremonies and abuses. The whole face of English Christianity was changing beyond recognition. Mary now decided that life in Edward's Protestant England was intolerable and she asked the emperor for help to flee abroad. Charles sent a squadron of ships, and a clandestine meeting took place in an Essex country churchyard between Mary's envoy and the imperial commander. Edward was outraged at his sister's defiance and disloyalty, and he followed eagerly the English countermeasures. Troops were sent to cut Mary off by land, and ships to intercept the imperial fleet but it was as much Mary's own hesitations as the actions of the English that led her to abandon the scheme. Brother and sister would now have to fight it out at home. The crux of the argument between Edward and Mary was over the Mass, the central sacrament that separates Protestant from Catholic. Mary might be prepared to stay in England, but she was not prepared to give up hearing the Mass, and Edward was not prepared to let matters rest. He ordered that Mary's chaplains should be taken away from her, and then he commanded her to come to see him in London. Mary was declared how long I had suffered her Mass in hope of her reconciliation, and how now? I could not bear it. She answered that her soul was God's, and her faith she would not change, nor dissemble her opinions with contrary doings. It was said, I constrained not her faith, but willed her, not as a king to rule, but as a subject to obey, and that her example might breed too much inconvenience. Sum omnipotentum. But Edward's fury at his sister had little effect. She continued to celebrate mass, even though several of her chaplains languished in the tower. But Mary herself was safe. She was Edward's legal heir. In the end, Edward could not touch her. Eighteen months later, came Edward's most decisive move towards a truly Protestant England. This is the prayer book of 1552, written and compiled by Edward's mentor, Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury. At Edward's coronation, the Archbishop had told the young king that he was to be a second Josiah, whose duty it was to bring a reformed Protestant faith to England and to abolish idolatry and Catholicism. This the second prayer book is the greatest single step to the achievement of that goal of a Protestant England. Gone were the halfway houses, the compromises and the fudges of the prayer book of 1549. 
In the text of the communion service, for instance, in 1549, there are two crosses. These represent the making of the cross by the priest, and it allowed the people to believe that the old Catholic miracle of transforming the bread and the wine into the actual body and blood of Christ was still taking place. In 1552, those crosses have gone. There's no question of the Catholic sacrifice. Instead, there is the pure, unadulterated word of God. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith, with thanksgiving. A whole world of Catholic religiosity is dead, and between the covers of this book, a new Protestant England, Edward's England, is born. Within the next few months, Edward himself would set off to inspect his England. At 14, Edward might be a king, but he was still a boy. He loved games and competition, and he loved to win, recording the details of victories and defeats faithfully in his chronicle. I lost the challenge of shooting it rounds and won at Rovers. Barnaby Fitzpatrick remained his most favoured companion. Above all, he enjoyed hunting. When Barnaby went abroad to France, Edward wrote him some telling, if rather pompous, advice. For women, as for forth, you may avoid their company. You may sometimes dance, but apply yourself to riding, hunting, such honest games. In the summer of 1552, Edward got his own chance to see a little more of the world. This is the ancient highway between Salisbury and Wilton. Almost certainly, Edward and his party would have ridden along this road on the summer progress of 1552. The progress was when the king and court abandoned the heat, stench and disease of summertime London for the country. The king would stay for a few days at a time in the houses of his aristocratic courtiers, hunting their parks and being wined and dined. But for Edward, it was his first real opportunity to see and to be seen. He was determined to make the most of it. When Edward set off on his progress, he was accompanied by nearly 4,000 men, all mounted. Within days, most of them were sent back to London because there were far too many to feed. Edward rode on with a more intimate group. This was his first chance to inspect England, his England. The country had ruled for five years and had begun to make truly Protestant. It was also a chance to think on his and his country's future and their past. Like many of the houses that Edward had stayed in during the progress, Mottisfont is a former abbey. Twenty years before, Edward's father, Henry VIII, had dissolved the monasteries and confiscated their land and buildings. The land had been sold off to aristocratic families who'd often converted the buildings into fine, stately homes as here. And behind me, you can actually see bits of the Gothic arches of the former abbey roughly incorporated into the masonry of the present house. The sight was so common that Edward probably never even noticed it. And if he did, he would have thought simply, good riddance to bad papist rubbish. And in any case, he had other things on his mind. Among them, was that most central of all subjects, money. <laughs> 
Edward was accompanied by the Privy Council and the Royal Cash Reserves, which were carried in a couple of coffers or chests. And the chests weren't very big, because the incompetence and corruption of Edward's council had nearly destroyed the royal finances. Edward, who, like all the Tudors, was interested in money, was distressed at this near bankruptcy. He worried about it. He tried to work out what to do, how to rescue the position. Edward was directly involved in the management of money during the progress because poverty had reduced his government to the meanest kind of penny pinching. Just before they'd left London, for example, his former stepmother, Anne of Cleves, had been told that she couldn't have her allowance paid. Edward had a very powerful sense of honour, so it was humiliating for him to be so poor, especially when his father had been so rich. Indeed, one of the purposes of the progress from Edward's point of view was that it gave him a chance to show that he could live up to, even improve upon, his father's legacy. The beginning of August, the royal party came down to the south coast at Portsmouth. Henry VIII had turned this whole area, the Isle of Wight, the great Ark of the Solent, into a huge naval military complex of dockyards and fortifications. His son, Edward, came and viewed his father's work with a cool and expert eye. First to be inspected was South Sea Castle here. This was one of the most modern and up-to-date of Henry VIII's fortifications. Nevertheless, Edward suggested a few minor improvements. Then he turned his attention to Portsmouth itself about half a mile up the coast there. He enthused about the harbour, superb, a mile long and able to take the greatest ships in Christendom. He was less enthusiastic, though, about the two forts which protected the camber, the narrow entrance to the harbour. These were ill-built, old-fashioned and wrongly sighted. He ordered them to be reconstructed forthwith. What Edward had seen at this stage of the progress gave him confidence, confidence to set the agenda literally. Because when he got back to London and drew up an action list for his government, item number one was the fortification of Portsmouth. And Edward's to-do list was becoming extensive. He'd already drawn up detailed plans for the creation of an English textile market to rival that of Antwerp as well as writing a long treatise on the further reform of the church. Soon he would devise a scheme to make the Privy Council more efficient. Edward was a great moderniser. He believed in planning, central control and efficiency. But the progress also shows that he was quite capable of pleasure. He'd written a kind of report on the progress to his friend Barnaby Fitzpatrick, who was on secondment to the armies of the French king, Henry II. In its own quiet way, the letter is one of the most revealing documents about Edward's character. It shows, above all, that he was capable of enjoying himself. He'd enjoyed the hunting, the fine food, the handsome houses that he'd stayed in, and, above all, the beautiful English countryside through which he'd passed. Indeed, there's more than a note of little Englander complacency and isolationism about this letter. Edward had seen his England, and he'd seen that it was good. Moreover, unlike the French king, he told Barnaby, he wasn't interested in laying waste the territories of his friends and neighbours. He was only concerned to fortify and to defend his own, this England. <laughs> There is little left today of Edward's England. Cowdray House, where once he was sumptuously banqueted beneath vivid wall paintings showing his father's victories over the French, has long been a ruin. <laughs> 
but one can still see the traces of its splendour and imagine the optimism with which Edward planned his and England's future. Edward was tremendously ambitious. If he had been able to do what he wanted to, then England would have been a truly different place. It would have been militarised, with a vast standing army and a network of efficient fortifications. He would have begun to centralise the economy, planning markets and investing in industry in a way that didn't happen in Europe for at least another century. He would have created an England of extreme religion, a puritanical religion that would have been rigorously enforced and policed. In short, he would have created a modern Protestant state, more akin to what happened in Prussia or Sweden than anything we now associate with England. But none of this was to be. Edward returned to London from the progress, fit and well. But in February, he started to cough. And by March, he looked very weak and thin. By April, he was vomiting blood and black and greenish matter. He had what doctors would now diagnose as a suppurating pulmonary infection. Then they called it a consumption and they could do nothing about it. The fate of Protestant England was slipping out of Edward's grasp. Edward knew that he was dangerously ill, perhaps even that he was dying. So his thoughts naturally turned to the succession. By law, that is, by his father's will, sanctioned by Act of Parliament, his successors were, first, his half-sister Mary, and second, his other half-sister, Elizabeth. But Mary was Catholic. If she were to succeed, it would undo everything, the whole Protestant achievement of Edward's reign. So Mary had to go. Elizabeth, on the other hand, was Protestant. But equally, she was resolutely committed to the principles of legitimacy and legality. She would never agree simply to be substituted for Mary. This meant that Elizabeth had to go as well. So who was Edward's heir? The young king's own answer to this question is contained in this document here. It's got the rather Adrian Mole-like title of My Device for the Succession and it's written in the unformed hand of a 15-year-old boy. But the mind behind it is entirely adult and mature. If Edward's half-sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, were to be excluded from the succession, then the obvious heirs were the descendants of his aunt Mary. But these were all women, her daughter Frances and her eldest granddaughter, Jane Grey. But Edward, as a good Protestant, disapproved of women rulers. So he doesn't leave the crown to Francis and Jane. Instead, he leaves it to their sons, their heirs male. But the production of sons takes time, at least nine months. And at some point, after the drafting of this document, Edward discovers that he doesn't have time. He's dying. So, very quickly, and with the minimum change, he alters his device. The Lady Jane's heirs males becomes, by removing an S and adding and her over a carrot, it becomes the Lady Jane and her heirs male. With three strokes of the pen, the dying boy had made Jane Grey heir of England. <laughs> In the last days of his life, Edward himself bullied and cajoled members of the Privy Council into endorsing his will. He died on July the 6th, 1553, in the faith in which he had been educated. His last words were a prayer in English of his own devising. Edward's death was kept secret even from his sisters, 
there were no last farewells, for nothing must get in the way of his scheme to save Protestant England. But it was all to be in vain. Despite the dying Edward's heroic efforts of will, his scheme for the succession failed. For Edward, preserving Protestantism was all that mattered, but the English decided differently. They wanted a real Tudor as the next monarch, and for that, they were prepared for anything, even for Edward's worst nightmare, a return.